Okay, so we will uh, get started. Um, we are very pleased to have uh, Professor Shashi Shekhar from University of Minnesota. He is a distinguished professor there, uh, got his PhD from University of California, Berkeley, and uh, he is um, IEEE Fellow, uh, AAA S Fellow, and um, have done very interesting work in data mining, um, special databases, and um, um, GPS related work, and so on. So we are very pleased to have him here to give a talk about his recent work. Wonderful. So, so today we'll talk about uh, spatial data mining. You know, this this is an area that our group has been developing for almost now 12, 13 years. And you can also kind of see the the color of my lenses. So I come from computer science, but almost since the beginning of my career, I have worked with spatial data. So earlier projects had to do with databases in terms of routing and query optimization. Uh, recent work has done you know, uh, data mining, but you also see a lot of community involvement in terms of conference organization. And this is a journal on advances of computer science for GIS encyclopedia. And most recently, a community workshop on spatial computing as a whole to develop visions for next uh, few years. Okay. So our group kind of works in two broad areas. One is spatial database, where we have had a variety of projects, and this illustrates a couple of them. So we had a project on parallelizing GIS range queries, and this was in context of a driving or tank simulation in order to use realistic terrain. Uh, back, you know, when my career started 91 and 92, it's hard to believe, but uh, our research projects were to explore in-car navigation devices. So what we are showing you here are efficient ways to store road maps on in-car GPS. You know, by 96, 97, this became commercial, so we were a little bit out of business. We had to find new problems. And one new routing problem that came our way is evacuation route planning. Uh, you know, the main difference here is, is that you are moving a large number of people. And again, in being in Florida, I don't have to explain to you what uh, hurricane evacuations look like, but it's a related problem. Uh, so in fact, before I go to rest of the talk on spatial data mining, let me quickly share a short four and a half minute video from Fox TV on our work on evacuation route planning. So if I could get the help to switch to video, and then we'll go to the data mining world. See now the music? It's criticizing the president. about evacuation and tinkering with the technology. Imagine trying to 
trying to figure out the logistics of an evacuation of the entire Twin Cities. There are a million people and 60,000 vehicles in the 10-mile area surrounding the Twin Cities. Shekhar's program calculates that it would take just a little more than nine hours and a million different routes to get everyone out of the 694-494 ring. It's an extreme example, but the software has already been put to a more practical test. When Minnesota's Department of Transportation needed someone to craft an evacuation plan for the Twin Cities, they called on Shekhar. Based on his calculations, the state planners radically changed their evacuation approach, deciding that people should walk rather than drive. In some areas, people would walk about a mile, then be picked up by mass transit and evacuated to safe zones. The state has already run computer model evacuations of five different places in the Twin Cities. Fox 9 asked Shekhar to show us what it would look like to evacuate the great Minnesota get-together. Suppose during the height of the state fair, there was a major chemical leak and everyone had to get out. If fairgoers jumped in their cars and drove, it would take nine hours to clear 100,000 people out of harm's way. It would take two-thirds less time, or just two hours, if everyone walked a mile and were then taken to safe zones by city buses. It increases the safety for the people of Minnesota. Minnesota's safety folks love Shikara's computer program. Well, it's a lot quicker than trying to hand map it out. It's also much faster than the other commercially available software that takes hours or days to run. This one runs. Uh, within a matter of seconds or moments. And the program may spread beyond this state's borders. Um, to me, like, if, if, if it is, not only does it have an application here in Minnesota, but it has a nationwide application across our country. And if we can help others with technology that we develop here, uh, we certainly ought to be willing to do that. Seem kind of complicated? Well, staff at the U of M are working to try to make the program very user-friendly so any first responder around the country can navigate the program with ease. I'm Chris Van Pilsen for Fox 9 News. Get on the music. Let's go. What would happen if a disaster struck the Twin Cities? Maybe turn the volume down here. Okay. So the second theme in our group started in terms of data mining, and that was roughly around 98, 99 time frame. Uh, a set of faculty members in our department wanted to focus on this, and I wanted to intersect it with spatial. And so there was an NSF workshop in 99 with Jai Wei Han from data mining side and Harvey Miller from GIS side, where a lot of us gathered. And that was a really nice launching pad for me because it appeared that the field was really open. Okay? So over 10, 12 years, we have actually worked on many different problems, ranging from location prediction to spatial anomalies to co-location to spatial clusters. And in this talk, I will describe many of this in detail. So I'm not going to mention much at this slide. Okay. So with this, let's maybe talk about what is data mining, what is spatial data mining, uh, you know, at least get the societal motivation and the basic idea, and then we'll formalize it. Okay. So data mining uh, you know, has come up in mid-90s, and it, the backdrop is in terms of uh, the data volumes going up. Okay? Reincarnation of this argument in last two, three years is the big data argument, but it's more or less the same idea. Okay? And people are essentially saying that now the data volume is so large and it's growing so fast that you can't have humans go through all the data. So you need some kind of tools to assist the humans. And data mining is one of those tools. Okay, there are other tools from machine learning, from visualization, from statistics, but data mining is in the same spectrum. Okay. So oftentimes, uh, it, you know, and we'll define this in a little bit more formally. Now, spatial computing itself, as I said, has also come up through in, in recent decades. You know, you see a lot of different software on this side and from last century, and you see many new things happening in this century. You know, things like Waze or OpenStreetMap and so on. Uh, so if you intersect the two, then we kind of create this area called spatial data mining. So here is getting towards the first formal definition of this field. Okay? So if you look at this definition, most of it is copied from the definition of data mining. Okay? So data mining people often talk about patterns. This is a keyword, and I will pretty soon show you examples of those. 
and then they put these adjectives in front. Okay? The first two adjectives are application specific. So this is applied field. Okay? Data mining never happens in a theoretical situation without a context. So it's always an application domain and we are trying to make sure that the patterns we find are useful to that application domain. It's also interesting in the sense that these are new patterns. These were not known before. Okay? And the computer science comes in over here. Usually the search space of the pattern is very, very large. So it's hard to go through by hand. And you want some kind of computer algorithm to sort through the space. Okay? The only part that we are adding to make it spatial data mining is this word spatial. So in spatial data mining, we are still looking for patterns which are useful and non-trivial. But we are primarily looking at geographic data or other kind of spatial data. Okay? So let's look at what kind of patterns are we interested in. And this is where you will start to see separation from classical machine learning and classical data mining. Okay? So here are a couple of pattern families. And if you know the common pattern families in machine learning or data mining, you can kind of see the analogs here. Okay? So the easiest one is this one. You probably know global outliers in statistics and machine learning. But here, they are a little bit different. They are really local outliers, and we call them spatial outliers. Okay? Uh, there is a vast field called clustering in machine learning. But the kinds of clusters which are of interest in geography are a little bit different, and we call them hotspots. And again, I'll show you the examples and formalize it. Association rule is down here. And again, in space, the old association rules don't work very well. So we have a generalization called collocation. And finally, your prediction models, the same way in machine learning, there are dozens of prediction models. And you probably have used many of them for vision, and you probably have a feeling for which ones work very well. But we will argue that as you bring spatial data, you again need to do something more than just take the old ideas and use it here. Okay, okay so let's look at some examples. What do these patterns look like? So this is the classical picture from 1854. How many of us have seen this before? Great. This is used in visualization. It's used in public health and all kinds of places. Uh, and we are using this to illustrate the first pattern family called hotspots. Okay, so the 1854 cholera you know, epidemic happened in London, and at the time, people did not know that it was waterborne. So the dominant hypothesis was that cholera is spread through air. Uh, but John Snow, one of the public health officials in London, made a map out of the deaths from the cholera. So these little dots are where people died. Okay? And he basically noticed that they were concentrated in a geographic area. You can kind of see this is the area where most of the deaths happened. Okay? But furthermore, he noticed that there is a water pump broad street water pump at the center. So he went and argued with city council to shut off this water pump. But since there was no science behind it, still took him a couple of days, and it did help. Okay? And soon after that, people, you know, the microscope was being invented at the same time. So the people started pointing the microscopes on the water to ask what is in the water that may be causing it. And it's about you know, a decade later, germ theory comes along, Louis Pasteur and all of this comes together. But anyway, this is a common pattern called hotspot. And what it means is that there is a geographic area, a neighborhood or something, where concentration of a phenomena is much higher, statistically much more significantly higher than outside. And people do this all the time. So Center for Disease Control, for example, uses this all the time. Uh, Kansas National Cancer Institute uses that. And if you find a geographic neighborhood with very high density of cancer, they launch an environmental investigation. About 10 years ago, this has now moved over to public safety. Police departments are doing this with crime data. So New York City and many others, they routinely do that. And if they find a neighborhood with high crime density, they again have social intervention or more police patrol. And now, finally, this is moving into uh, public transportation. So if you look at, I will show you some examples of pedestrian fatalities from Orlando and so on. So people on many other domains are using this pattern. So this is the most common pattern family from this literature that is being used. So is it all done? And can we go home? Or, or is there something left to do? And we'll argue there is a lot more to do. Uh, first of all, you know, when you look at real data, it's not just spatial. You have time. And in urban areas, you also have to worry about your transportation network. So for example, if you look at this set of crimes in Houston, you can use the classical clustering like k-means to find these ellipses. Okay? And even sat scan will find circles. But if you looked at it in terms of routes, you might find this summarization more interesting. Okay? Because urban area, a lot of things revolve around the transportation network. So doing this is still pretty open. 
One thesis is getting completed in our group, but this is still a pretty open problem. The other issue is time. Even the crime reports that police has, has a time stamp. And you now notice that you know, these hot spots are not as static as Jon Snow might lead us to believe, and they change over time. This is showing you 24-hour activity in Amsterdam. And in this case, even the conceptualization of this, I mean, what are these? Do we need some adjectives like spreading hotspot, you know, shrinking hotspots, periodic hotspot? Again, modeling of spatiotemporal aspect of hotspot is wide open. Okay? So it's still a pretty open area. Let's look at second pattern family, which is what I call spatial outliers or anomalies. And let me illustrate this using the traffic data from Twin Cities. So this is the highway network in Twin Cities, and you notice there are a lot of sensors on these highways. Okay? So about 4,000 loop detectors, and they tell you the traffic almost every 30 seconds. So let's actually zoom on to a piece of this data to see what it looks like. So we are taking this one freeway called I-35W, and we lay out all these 60 sensors, which are a mile apart, on this y-axis. Okay? On the x-axis, we have put time of the day. This is midnight, morning, noon, and so on. Okay? And the color coding is telling you the traffic volume. So you can again see many patterns in this. You can see rush hours, you know, morning people are kind of going from north to the city. It's only one side of the highway. Okay? And then, you know, evening they are going home. But the pattern of interest here is this one. If you look at sensor number nine, okay, look at sensor number nine. Okay, there is something interesting about it. Okay? So first of all, notice that sensor number nine is giving readings which are not global outliers. If I look at any individual colors here, there are plenty of those in the data set. So if I just apply your traditional statistical outlier detection, it's not going to complain. Okay? But there is something fundamentally strange about it, because people who deal with vision and image processing and so on, you deal with physical world. So you know that you know, if I am seeing nothing at sensor 9 and 11, but I am seeing traffic at sensor 10, that's something strange. right? It's a discontinuity in space. Right? It means you know, people came in and they disappeared. Right? It doesn't happen as much in the physical space. So this is a spatial discontinuity, and this is usually referred to spatial outlier. Okay? When we showed this pattern to the transportation folks in Twin Cities, they felt this was a bad sensor, and they had they dug up and changed it. Okay? So this is another pattern family. All right, the third one, predictive models. And this may look very familiar to lots of us here because you, know, you have done a lot of machine learning. But here the problem is spatial. So this is a marshland, and these are bird nests in the marshland. These are the vegetation, and this is water. Okay? And what we want to do is to predict the nest-worthy sites in this particular habitat. And that might help us in terms of in, you know, the environmental planning and so on. You have a lot of explanatory variables, like vegetation, durability, or distribution, distance to water, and so on. So given all this, we want to predict nest-worthy site. Okay? You can easily convert it to a machine learning problem. You can impose a grid on this. It's a raster data set. So you can imagine you know, these rows and columns and pixel. You can make a table. Each pixel is a row. And for each pixel, you can say class is yes or no. And then you can put variables like this. right? And then if I ask you which methods would you run on this, you know, what would you recommend? What would be your favorite machine learning methods to predict nests out of these kind of variables? It's more like a prediction kind of thing, classification prediction kind of model. And uh, it's like uh, the support vectors of an SVM. You could try support vector machine. That is one. But your group already knows that you will need to do something more than that. Because you notice that um, you know, these things are clustered. There is autocorrelation here. There is a smoothness. Right? So your group will probably also put MRF at the back end to do the smoothing. Okay? So these are a little bit different problems than classical machine learning. Let's look at the fourth one. And this one was not there in the literature when you know, we started. And in some sense, our group helped define this pattern. And this is what we call co-location. So, the easiest way to think about it is through an example. So suppose I'm looking at a map. And in this map, there are many features. So for example, you see this uh, eagle, and there are many nests for the eagle, or fire, or dry tree, house, bluebird, and so on. And the questions being asked are the following. Okay? So I'm asking, are there pairs of these event types who's in, you know, such that their instances are often together in geography? So whenever I see one, I expect the other one to be there with high probability. Okay. So do we see any pairs in this? Right. Birds and houses. 
So you see bluebird and houses, they often occur together. Not, you know, often occur together. Not always, but quite often. Okay? And if you, you know, look more carefully, you will find another pair. Okay? So these are called co-location pattern. And basically the input is you have a map with many, many different feature types and instances. And output are pair or triples of things which happen together. Okay? All right. So this is making the same problem a little more complex. Now we have moving objects. And each color is a type of the object. So you, know, you have yellow objects, red objects, blue objects, green objects. And I'm asking the same question now. Do you see pairs of object types or pairs of colors here which often move together in this case? OK, so blue and red actually turns out to be also the number one pair that we will bring out. Okay. But again, you can ask a similar co-occurrence or co-location question in space and time. Okay. So, so this kind of gives you a feel for what type of patterns we are looking for. And as you can imagine, in each case, there were lots of candidates. So it takes little while for us to do it by hand. And the data sets I was showing you are really small, really toy data set, right? Real data sets are much larger, so you need algorithm. So in order to complete the definition, I will also say what is not spatial data mining. Because uh, the term data mining started in mid-90s with a very specific meaning. But pretty soon it became a folklore, right? Media started stretching the meaning and everybody started stretching the meaning. So oftentimes you see Google search as data mining, but not in our talk, okay? Google search is querying in our vocabulary. It's not data mining. Uh, statistical hypothesis testing, again, is not data mining because you have very little combinatorics, just one hypothesis. Also, you know, if you are finding patterns which are very obvious, such as weather in nearby places are similar, we, we do, are not interested in this, and we are not interested in non-spatial data. So with this, okay, I'm going to skip the details. So with this, you know, hopefully we have given you a basic sense of what this overall uh, field of spatial data mining is about, and what do patterns look like, and even a little bit of societal motivation. So before I go into the more detail, trying to define the input in some more detail, statistical foundation, and then data mining, you know, pattern mining algorithms, let me pause and ask, are there any questions on the motivation or basic definition of the field? What is spatial data mining? OK. Looks OK. All right. So let's go down and quickly take a look at the data. Uh, and then you know, we'll go through the, the other mathematical found parts as well. So spatial data is a little bit different than the classical number and text and so on. You know, Many of us in this group are using it anyhow. So you can look at. Um, you know, image data, which we call raster in case of spatial. These are images which are geo-registered. So for every pixel, we know the location. Okay? So this is one common type of data. Uh, but you know, the key thing is that things are geographically referenced. So everything I see in my data set, I know the location. Okay? And people use you know, multiple formats like raster, or sometimes they digitize it and they make vector out of it. So the main difference here is, that, for example, for the river, you will have a center line. Okay? For each road, you will have a center line. So instead of an image, now it's a collection of points, lines, polygons. Okay? So this is sort of your second dominant data format. And I heard a couple of us are downloading data from Google Map in KML format, a few of us. And you probably see this is more KML style, whereas this is Google Earth style. And then finally, if you look at the road map and transportation networks, they are often modeled as graphs. So road intersection may be nodes, and road segment connecting intersections may be edges, and so on. So these are three basic data types in this world. Okay. Now this world has also made progress in standardizing the relationships. Okay, so spatial data, one of the core challenge is that you have lots of relationships, and they are not explicit. Okay, so in, in the old data set, if you are in a database, most relationships are explicit, whereas here they are implicit. Okay, so for example, distance. When the data comes, you have the objects, but you have to go and compute the distance. But there are many other relationships of interest. Okay? So distance is, is only one family. People have looked at direction. People have looked at topology. Maybe you know, uh, USA and Canada, they touch each other if you look at their boundaries. Or Orlando is inside Florida. So people have tried to standardize the set of these spatial relationships. And there has been a major movement in, uh, so I'm going to skip this. In terms of this standard, Open GIS Consortium, roughly mid-90s came up with simple feature types. 
and in that one they essentially give you six data types so these three as well as collections of points collections of lines and collections of polygon they also standardized the operations and the most interesting one was topological they came up with about a dozen topological operation and they argued that it's in some sense complete you're not going to need anything more and how many of us know LNS algebra from artificial intelligence okay couple of us so this is a generalization of that to two dimension okay in addition they gave you a few more computational geometry operation and you know and few more like coordinate system and so on which are relevant to GIS now the topological operation have a very nice underpinning mathematical underpinning in terms of this what is called nine intersection model and again we are not going to go into the detail but the idea is that for each object you have three topological properties inside outside and boundary so if you take a pair of object you will get nine combinations in terms of intersection so here you see a boundary of a interior of a exterior of a and here you see for the B and these are the nine intersection and for each if you use a boolean value you will get a matrix like this so all these topological operations have a unique signature in this nine intersection model and using this you can talk about completeness and so on so a very nice mathematical theory was underlying this standardization okay. so so it, this is a good standard to know because this is widely implemented even commercially so if you are using things like Postgres, PostGIS, how many of us use SQL products here? Few of us, great. So Postgres, PostGIS will implement it, Oracle Spatial will implement it, IBM DB2 Spatial will implement it. And if you look at KML and Google, it also follows very similar kind of uh, model, but they haven't, they're not very advanced to capture much of this. Okay. okay. So this is a good beginning. It brought a consensus to the field and it was really, really, uh, you know, a, a establishing a common language in mid 90s which brought a lot of people together but there is a lot more in this field which has to be standardized and as time goes by we are going to see more of this particularly in the area of spatio-temporal and terrain okay so a lot more is kind of moving forward but these don't have much consensus so there is room for creativity okay so people are looking at kind of representing many of these things in a standard way and defining mathematically clean models okay Great. So this is all I wanted to say about the input. So hopefully with this we have a feel for, you know, what are we mining? What are we really analyzing? And again, I'll pause here and see if there are any quick questions on what our inputs look like before we see the patterns and outputs. Okay. Everyone comfortable with this? Okay, great. All right. So let's go and now look at statistical foundation and try to see, you know, as you analyze spatial data, are there any new, you know, statistical challenges? Okay. So this is the main thing I would like to remind and coming from vision and image processing, some of this will not surprise you. If you look at classical data mining or classical statistics, they often make these kind of assumptions. Okay? One of common assumption is IID, where you say your learning samples are drawn independently of each other and they are from identical distribution. In some methods like linear regression, it's in black and white. Okay? If you read the description, it will acknowledge that very, very clearly. In many other model, it's not explicit, but I would actually ask you to think about carefully and ask what is happening inside SVM or decision tree. And you will notice that when we deal with things, oftentimes there is an implicit assumption of this kind. Okay? Now, when you come to spatial data, we, we discard this assumption. Right? So in image processing world, when you use Markov random field, it's basically acknowledging the same thing. Right? It's going down there. So this is in some sense you know, a major departure so a lot of methods from classical statistics or data mining do not carry over to spatial data if you know particularly if they make this assumption so you have to acknowledge this and in order to model this in spatial statistics we create a notion it's, it's, it's a dual of your Markov random field notion but this is called spatial autocorrelation and in spatial statistics there are many metrics and I will at least give you examples of one or two okay so you can actually look at a real data set and go down and compute these functions. And if these functions come out to be sort of, uh, you know, special case would be that you could, these functions could show you, yes, things are independent. But most likely in most data sets, they show you that they are not independent, okay? Then you can worry about how to model it in your own problem, whether you go with MRF or you use other models. Okay? The other challenge is called heterogeneity. And this is again something you have probably seen in vision. So this morning, in fact, we were seeing an image of people in a stadium. 
And as you can tell that, you know, uh, based on the distance from the camera, the density of people will change, right? But a lot of that happens in geography kind of data set for a different reason. Not because of camera, but your features themselves have this kind of heterogeneity, okay? All right, so let's kind of uh, quickly give you a glimpse of this field, and we'll just capture these couple of notions that we will need in, in our own data mining models. So spatial statistics, again, is a rich field. You know, this is one of the earliest books, Cressy. It's considered the Bible, but a little mathematical. But since then, a lot of new books have come which are a little less mathematical and easier to digest. And there are theories coming from many different sides. You know, this has come mostly from geology and mining side whereas point processes has come more from public health side. But there are different kinds of theories, and again, we don't need to concern with all of them, but let's at least capture two, three basic concepts. The first, the concept of autocorrelation. Okay? And what I will try to do is to give you a qualitative kind of description and then give you one quantitative model. Okay? So this is a, a qualitative description. Uh, Tobler you know, wrote in a paper basically saying all things are related. This is coming from ecology. But nearby things are more related than far away things. Okay? This is often referred to as the first law of geography. Okay? <laughs> and it's basically autocorrelation. Right? So now let's look at this in a, a visual manner. Okay? So here is a map with IID assumption. Here what is done is each pixel property is drawn independent of all other. And here is a real map. And as most of us will agree that maps we see are more likely to be the one on the right than on the left. Okay? All right. So how do we quantify it? How do we go beyond the visual and the qualitative side? And there are many, many measures in the literature. So let me just show you one for, you know, for um, the illustration. And if you're interested, you can look at many more. Okay? So here is one measure for point processes. So in this measure, what we are assuming is that we are given a set of points. Okay? So maybe those are road accidents, or those are you know, the cancer deaths, and so on. And we are basically asking, are these points independent of each other? or do they tend to cluster together, okay? And if you are interested in measuring that, then an interesting measure is Ripley's K function, and this is what it is measuring. So what it does is, basically it puts, it puts a circle of radius H around each point, and it counts how many other points fall inside that circle, okay? And then you can look at average number of that, okay? So essentially K function is saying that if I put a circle around a random point, how many other points are within the circle? Okay. If these points were independent of each other, then the count will be proportional to area of the circle. Right? And that is this median line. It's growing as area of circle, pi h square. This is the radius of the circle. Okay? But if in your data set, if your counts are quite different than this, so this is the mean and that's the standard deviation around the, the rand, complete spatial random. But if your numbers are way above, then you would say these points tend to cluster, right? They like each other, they cluster. In some data sets, it could be actually way below. And then you say these points don't like each other, they, they repel, okay? and so on. So this is one measure. And there are other measures like this. But let's carry this through to, what, to our examples. So the median is the Poisson distribution? Median is based on Poisson distribution. So there is a notion called complete spatial random, which all it does is to take a Poisson process and generates point on a space. And if you did that, then essentially if I put a circle around any point, the number of other points will be proportional to area of the circle. But Poisson process is the, the generating process for this point process model in there. Yeah. OK. All right, so this measure can also be used for cross-correlation. So if I want to ask if you have a set of, let's say, McDonald's and Burger Kings, and I want to ask, are their locations independent of each other, or do they tend to co-cluster, sort of like the co-location problem we were talking about, you can use a similar measure. The only difference is, now let's say if I put a circle around McDonald's, I am going to count Burger King. right? If I put a circle around Burger King, I'm going to count McDonald. And again, if these were independent of each other, your count should be growing as the area of the circle. But if they are interacting with each other, you will see higher count and, or lower count. Okay? So in fact, for this co-location picture that we were talking about, where we saw these things were kind of co-located, you can see the cross, Ripley's cross K function. So here is two independent, completely spatial random processes. And the two pairs we were kind of saying are interacting, they are way above that, right? And so on, yeah. So when you're saying that 
two things are related to each other based on the E circles and, and the right. statistics. Right. Uh, my understanding is that it depends on how we define the relationship. For example, right. uh, Burger King versus McDonald's. Right. They right. want to compete versus each other, so right. we, we think that they right. should be close. Mm -hmm. But if we look at different okay. uh, stores of Burger King, right. they don't want to be close, they right. want to cover more. Right. So this is so perfect. This is the perfect example of autocorrelation versus cross-correlation. So if I'm looking at Burger King's by itself, which notion am I looking at, autocorrelation or cross-correlation? Autocorrelation, right? So the locations of Burger King, you are saying that they should have very low autocorrelation. They should be somewhat independent of each other. Uh, and so for this example, that's good enough. Of course, if you know the population is not that uniformly distributed, so they will still mimic your population distribution, right? But whereas I'm, if I'm looking at interaction between Burger King and McDonald, you're looking at cross-correlation, right? In traditional statistics, we are mostly thinking about cross-correlation. We seldom talk about autocorrelation, but in this space you talk about both. Okay. Okay. MRF is an autocorrelation kind of process. Okay. And if you have done time series analysis, many of you know ARMA and ARIMA model, autoregressive moving average. They are special cases of these in one dimension. But time also has directionality, so computationally they are simpler. But, but you have seen these notions before, it's just being organized now. Okay. So that was the first law, autocorrelation, and as I said, they have, people have quantified it, and I will show you how to use it in prediction model and so on as well. Okay? Let's pick up the second idea, and the second idea is that of heterogeneity. And essentially, you know, this is something which not a lot of people have talked about, but my, at least Michael Goodchild, who is one of the key person in this field, calls it the second law of geography. And all it is saying is that, you know, uh, no two places on earth are alike, you know, things vary from one place to the other, okay? If you came from domains like agriculture uh, and so on, then you will see this thinking everywhere. In fact, you know, in agriculture, if they want to know what plant should we grow in Florida, they will never take anything point blank from another region. They will always bring it and test it here, okay? Uh, unfortunately, in physics, they think very differently, right? Physics, we want generality. One thing works everywhere because you know they were building theories about other planets and they couldn't ever go there so they had to build and test the theory on earth and make the assumption of generality right but in geography people think about heterogeneity and they say things are different so here is a very simple way to illustrate it it's also called simpson's paradox in in ecological fallacy and so on so suppose i'm looking at this data set okay some two variables x and y okay if i fit a single regression model it will show you positive slope okay but if you separated the data into two groups, the red group and blue group, and fit the lines, you will see the local slopes are different from global. Okay? So this is a classical example of heterogeneity. It's telling you that your data is not from a single distribution. And if you force fit a single global model, you're going to get weak and possibly incorrect result. Right? And you should separate it out. Uh, be lack of time, I'm not going to show you real example, but very similar things happen with, uh, for example, phenology data lilac blooming data set you see exactly same thing if you look at the whole data set it actually appears that things are blooming uh, later and later uh, but if you split mississippi east and west then you get the proper slope okay things of that kind you observe and the reason is that the number of data points that have grown over time there is a lot more data in the west now than 50 years ago okay. so in this one then yeah. you have to do like segmentation you have to know yes. which points belong to that yes so do you yeah. guys use like uh, what's called rense you know random sampling and consensus? constructed so here actually this is a very simple example i will show you one model what they do is it they do it in a continuous manner hmm. so if you are let's say doing linear regression hmm. there is a generalization called geographic weighted regression hmm. so your coefficients your slope hmm. and your uh, intercept is actually a function of location. So they are not single numbers, they are maps. So you do it in a very continuous manner. right? This will be the simplest. From one distribution you went to two, but really what you want to do is to do place-specific models. So you have lots of models and it varies smoothly. Yeah, right? we have envisioned here what we call half transform. Yes, yeah. That's another thing to do. Right. So we are looking at half transform in a different context. When I come to that, I'll, I'll bring that up. Yeah. Yeah, we're looking at that's more for shape detection, right? Yeah. yeah. There are a lot of ideas which go across these domains. Okay. The third third issue that comes in spatial statistics, let me very quickly mention, is called edge effect. So here, you know, this is a data set from North Korea where you know uh, the green areas are cropland, 
Okay. And the red is also cropland, but the red ones are not close to transportation. So you see black is, is the road or blue is a river. So if a cropland is close to transportation, it's green. If it is not close, it is red. Okay. So this was a test data set given to us to demonstrate spatial data mining. And, uh, and we basically defined outliers in terms of these croplands not accessible by transportation, and those were flagged as red. But in this example, I have more confidence in flagging red things in the center, but not as high confidence on the edge. Can anyone again guess why the confidence is low on edge? Okay, if you look at maps, yeah. Okay. Because the information on the other side is missing, right? So on the edge, in geographic data set, unless you take the entire surface of the earth, you always have this edge issue, right? And statistically, they actually go and model that. So your confidence models take into account do you have the complete context or not? But you know there are these kinds of issues which are modeled in spatial statistics. And again, I'm not going to show you the quantitative model, just the qualitative is enough. Uh, also tell you that this field is fast evolving. Actually, a lot of developments in the field have happened in the last 30 years because many models in this field are very compute heavy. Until computers became powerful in about late 80s, you couldn't really use and develop it too far. So a lot of things are still being you know, developed, like for example, spatio-temporal, is, is a big area where you know people are struggling and working things out. Also, network data, urban data sets, these theories are being developed. But there is sufficient amount of you know it's a current theory in terms of point processes and so on that can be used. Okay, great. So again, pause here. Any quick questions on the statistical fundamentals being different as you go to spatial data mining? Okay, great. So let's use these basic ideas and say what happens when you go to the data mining world and how do our models change because these properties have changed. And what I'm going to show you is primarily these specialized techniques which take into account these properties directly instead of rele you know, relegating them to feature selection. You know, this is something you can always do to create a lot of special features and feed it into classical data mining model. In some cases, they do pretty well, but you know, the better is to actually use techniques which directly take this into account. So I'm going to skip the details and kind of go you show you uh, the things. Okay? And what I will do now is to use your machine learning classifications. We'll start with supervised learning process like classification and prediction, and then slowly go to unsupervised learning techniques. In each case, the idea would be to tell uh, what is new if you bring in spatial properties. OK, so we are back to this problem, the prediction problem. So this is our prediction variable, bird nests. And these are explanatory variables. And the idea is to predict these bird nests out of this. And so here. As I was mentioning, if you use classical machine learning things like decision trees or regression, then you would have trouble with IID assumption. Okay? We can tell that these are smoothly varying map. There is heavy autocorrelation. And even here, if you compute Ripley's K function, that will come out to be positive. Okay? So how have people changed the models? So here are you know, two quick examples. In the reference, so for example, we know linear regression. It's a very popular model in statistics. And this, a lot of us can recognize, is the Bayesian classifier. And pe people have added autocorrelation to each. So when you look at regression, then they added this new term. And this is called autoregression term. And this is what it basically means. So it's saying nest at a location is partially explained by the explanatory features at the same location. But it's partially explained by the nests in the neighborhood. Okay? This is sort of like MRF kind of world. W matrix is your MRF matrix, and you are putting a smoothing in here, right? So very sim familiar to a lot of us. And you can do the same thing in other models. So here in Bayesian classifier, it's written the same way, that probability of a class at a location depends not only on explanatory feature on the same location, but also the class levels in the neighborhood. And you can write Bayesian rule and work through that. Okay? So this is what sometimes is called MRF Bayesian classifier. Okay? Uh, and there are other classifiers where you can bring in the same idea. So one thesis in our group right now is looking at decision trees and trying to change the, the nodes in the decision tree to look at not only local features but also neighborhood. Okay? And if you actually model it this way, as you have seen with MRF smoothing, your classification accuracy in this bird nest case went up about 10 to 20 percent. So this was an ecology thesis. And originally they were trying simple regression and neural network and getting only about 50-60% accuracy. And with this kind of spatial autoregression, it went up about 15-20%. Okay. There are other issues still left in this domain, and I will illustrate just one of them. Uh, 
And here it's essentially showing that despite using these models, we still assume that our errors are independent of each other. Okay? So let's look at this example. Suppose this is a real map and there are three nests in these three pixels. Okay? So in the rasterized version, these cells are marked as actual, actual nests. Okay? Now let's consider two prediction models. Okay, one prediction model puts the nests over here. Okay, that's C. The other one puts the nest over here. So let me ask two questions. The question number one, what is our own preference? How many of us prefer model C over model D? Okay. How many prefer C? How many prefer D? Okay. So we see D more hands went up. Okay. Now ask yourself this, you know, if I was looking at the ranking usually done in statistics or spatial statistics, how will they rank the model C and D? What do you think is the ranking there? Probably it's probably the same. They both make six mistakes, right? Because they assume errors are ID. But you just, we just told, I mean, some of us prefer D. Why did we prefer D? Why didn't we go with the statistical rank? It's closer. It's closer, right? So your errors are not just IID. You, you look at geographic properties. And these are not modeled very well. But the idea is, again, you know, if you are doing maximum likelihood kind of estimators, to put a penalty term which has some geographical property. But again, not a lot of literature or consensus here. Okay. okay, let's now go to second family. Let's go to clustering. And clustering is an interesting space because most popular clustering techniques are very spatial to begin with. You know, if you look at k-means clustering, it uses distance, right? If you use, you know, db scan and so on, there others look density. But still there are differences in how classical machine learning and statistics thinks about it and how spatial statistics thinks about it. So here are three different inputs. And now we can actually talk about the Poisson process. So this is the, the complete spatial randomness generated out of Poisson. Right? Uh, this is, you can, as you can tell, this is positive autocorrelation and this is negative autocorrelation. Okay? So this is your Burger King example. These stores are as far away from each other as possible. Assume uniform customer density. Right? So let's say if we feed it into classical clustering techniques. So what are the popular clustering techniques we use here? K-means. So if you feed it to K-means, K-means will give you these kind of outputs, right? So it will, you know, here it, it will always find you whatever, you know, K you give you, it will find you groups, right? So in spatial statistics, how would we deal with it? John, do you, do you have a feel what, what a SAT scan or hotspot detection will <laughs> say? Okay, so here are the, the changes. So this, the middle one, actually outputs will be similar. Okay, it will basically give you these dense areas, the green ones, okay? On the left one, actually it will say that, you know, there may be one or two dense areas, but they are by chance. So you shouldn't really be doing clustering on this. It's a complete spatial random, okay? There is nothing significant here. So don't bother, just ignore it. And most interesting is this one. It will actually say that it's not clustered, it's declustered. These points don't like each other. They're separate from others. This is negative autocorrelation, okay? And so if you look at software like SatScan, you know, what it basically does is to try various circles and it will give you the circles inside which the density is very high. So it will give you these green areas, okay? So it's very different thinking in spatial world, okay? Uh, in general machine learning, I have never kind of seen people go like this. Okay? So in this one, yeah. when you look at circuit, you are simply looking at distance, right? You are looking at distance and right. using the distance right. to group them. So isn't it right. the same like... A, K-means is using... Right. So, right. so actually, to be fair, let me maybe explain what this does. Okay. So K-means is a partitioning technique. So no matter what the data is, if I give him K10, it will give me 10 partitions. No matter whether the data overall has high autocorrelation or low autocorrelation. Right. This is actually more of a density-based technique. So it's not a partitioning technique. It will basically, it has a choice to say, look, there are no statistically significant dense areas. It can say that, which is what it is doing here right or doing here or it can say look you know I tried many circles the once it tries it it puts the center on one of the observation and uh, the circumference on another observation so there are basically n choose two circles it will try for each circle it will say look, look let me look at the density inside which is the number of points divided by area and density outside and look at essentially likelihood ratio and if the likelihood ratio is high then it will do a p-value test 
So it will basically, it's looking for dense areas, and it has a choice to say no dense areas or many dense areas, and so, so on. Is it like a mean shift? Do you guys call it a mean shift? Uh, that is, you know, envision a mean sure. shift technique. Is to find to dense areas? To find the cluster, to do the cluster. Okay. So that also look at the distribution. Okay, so this so I do not know the technique. Some mode of distribution. Okay. okay. So does it also do significance testing to say this mode is is significantly higher than the the average or global that average? That you know, okay. It's used somehow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mean shift is a fixed radius. Okay. So maybe after the talk, this is something we should look at and, and check. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but I think there are two differences. One is it's not a partitioning technique. It's, it's a density thresholding. Mm -hmm. Another way to visualize it is the following. It's not a 100% a accurate visualization. Mm -hmm. But if you created a density map out of it, mm -hmm. right? So you put little Gaussian on each point, and you add up the Gaussian. So you're going to get a terrain of the probability density function, right? And on that terrain, you can say the mean probability density is this. And it's, let's say it's all normal distribution for simplicity. Then two standard deviation cutoff is here. So then I'm basically looking at in the terrain the peaks which exceed at least two standard deviation. That's basically one simple way to think about what it is doing. Okay. Yeah. Right. Right. So in this case, thresholds are based on p-values and likelihood ratios. So if you know the statistical significance testing, you can essentially say, give me everything which is you know, 95% uh, confident that it's very different from the mean density of this population. Okay? Or that's typically what is done. So they do p-value and likelihood ratio tests, okay. which is seldom done for machine learning clustering. You know, it, it's not done. There are some density-based clustering techniques in machine learning, like DB scan is one technique or chameleon is another technique which will find you connected regions. But I haven't seen the significance testing in machine learning literature as much. Okay. All right. Okay, so this is something which came out of mid-90s from National Cancer Institute, and as I said, it's now being used in police departments and also in transportation. And again, remember in these domains, in health, uh, you know, they, they are statistically much more sophisticated, so they always like statistical significance, so that's where it came from. Where is it going next? So there are two areas, you know, that it is going. And so, so one of which what we call is spatial concept and theory aware cluster finding. And uh, so here is one theory. This comes out of social science called routine activity theory, which basically says that, you know, uh, so if you're looking at serial criminal in crime analysis, they don't commit crime right next to their house because their neighbors know them, right? <laughs> so they go a little bit further. But they don't go very far because there is transportation cost. So oftentimes their footprint is something like this. Okay? Same thing happens if you have a meth lab. right? They can't sell it in the immediate neighborhood, but they don't go very far. Right? So one of the interesting part is if you know pat the shape of your pattern, then instead of looking for circles, we may look for these donut holes or rings. Right? And actually, this is where we are trying Huff transforms as well. Okay? Uh, there are different ways to enumerate rings, and we are trying to see which one works. Okay? The other one I briefly talked about is instead of talking about circles, which may or may not have any meaning, we look at geographical features like rivers, streams, and road. And so here is one example. And actually, maybe some of you will recognize this road map. This is from Orlando. This is pedestrian fatalities near Orlando. And as you can tell, uh, you know, this is the input data. So what's the better way to summarize it? Here is k-mean clustering. This is k-mean with network distance. And here is a route-based summarization, the last one, which is a thesis just being completed in our group, so right? So you know where this is because we need to avoid this. This one. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we can zoom into this map. Actually, they have, uh, you know, this is not a great news for me to share, but Orlando ranks very high in yeah, pedestrian. Yeah. Really yeah. And it, these are primarily, I would say, arterial road. They're high speed, but they don't have pedestrian walkways next to them. Mm. But turns out that there are, you know, apartments and other buildings and people cross. So, yeah. Okay. So, I think time-wise we should watch a little bit. So, we have about five minutes left. So, should I try to wrap up now or we have a few more minutes? 
few more minutes. Okay, minutes. okay. okay. all right. Get back to the previous slide. Okay. okay. So, so mm -hmm. uh, in, in the last one, we have one, one cluster at the top, then the red cluster, then the blue cluster, right. and, the, and the green one. Yeah. Generally, do you for employ mm. any specific technique yeah, right. within, you, uh, within your method mm. to distinguish that the red one is not basically a branch mm. of a brown one, but right. rather a different cluster. Yes, yes, yeah. So, so this problem, you know, if you actually look at its computing side, there are some very interesting challenges. Okay. So first of all, what are the candidate routes that you want to consider? So if you look at arbitrary routes, the candidate space is very, very large, okay, more than exponential. So that doesn't work. So one way we made it computationally tractable is to say we only look at shortest paths. So now on your network, if the road number of road intersections is n, we are looking at n choose 2. Okay? And that will usually separate those kind of things, because as you know, most, most roads are relatively straight and you know, not far from straight. But you can put further constraints and say that for each cluster, make sure the road name is uniform. But, but okay. this, this uh, at least to my understanding, this mm. only works when we when our data is a structure. So we know that these right. data are coming from a city yes. with the uh, with the roads. Yes. Not from, yeah. for example, a jungle that right. some people just pass by. Right. Right. So this is for urban scenario. So that's what we are saying. Use geographic concept. In a jungle, the concepts of interest may be rivers, streams, lakes, you know, or forest patches, and so on. So here yeah, we are using yeah. GIS. You, you know the here road. we know the road map. Yeah, yeah, and that's very typical of urban data sets. Yeah. So when you report road accident, the road names are very always there, right? When you report crime, you report disease. Street addresses are there. So as you come to urban space, then roads and transportation layers are interesting. Mm -hmm. But in natural spaces, as I said, there are other geographic notions or features people have talked about, yeah. But if you don't have any of this, then you have to go back to K-mean like thing, yeah. Great. All right, so I think I'm going to maybe skip the outlier detection. The, the only thing I want to mention is the, the definition. So if you think about a very simple one-dimensional space, let's say this is location and this is attribute, then the traditional global outlier, they give you things like the maxima or the minima. Okay, whereas the spatial outlier is looking for discontinuity. So if you look at this point S, which is very different from the neighbor, okay, that's what we are looking for. So it's a little bit different. Basically, if you go to derivative space, then this will be jumping out. And there are different techniques which we don't need to go through. And I think there are different techniques here. And one of the interesting insight from our group was that no matter which technique you use, the computational structure is very similar. And in database terms, it's called a spatial join. Okay, and that's the only thing message we want to come out. And let me maybe wrap this up. And we'll go to. Okay, so we'll briefly go to this collocation one, and then we'll kind of wrap up the talk. So this one actually a good way to understand the novelty here is to first re remember what is association rule. And let me have a quick show of hand. How many of us know association rules from here? Couple of us. Okay. So this is of legendary proportion in data mining literature. It came out of 1984, and this is what it is illustrating. At that time, Walmart was trying to figure out which items sell together. You know, they carry up to a million items, and if they could figure that out, then they used what is called the loss leader strategies. They put one on sale, and they make money on the other. <laughs> it, it's sort of like your cell phone, right? Your cell phone hardware is discounted. We pay for the minutes. Mm -hmm. So Walmart was asking this question, and one of the legendary examples they came out with was diaper and beer sales were correlated <laughs> in, <laughs> in blue-collar areas in the evening. Okay, they even had uh, demo, you know, the demographers go and follow these people to interview them, right? But anyway, this problem, they had a whole bunch of transactions. So customer one buys these, customer two buys these, and then out of this, they do this testing. The interesting part of this was the following. You know, first thing that may come to your mind to solve this problem is something like chi-square test or Pearson correlation coefficient. But they concluded that that was computationally too expensive. Even though they had an 8,000 node machine in 1984, they concluded they couldn't do it. So they went to simpler statistical measures called the support and confidence, which is just basic <laughs> frequency and basic conditional probability. And these tend to have nice computational properties so that you can scale up very fast. One of which is that this support, as you can tell, the support for this pair, diaper and beer, is going to be lower than the support for diaper. Okay, so it's upper bounded, and that's what gives you speed up. So a sparse data set, 
you can first look at the singletons and then prune out the things which are not frequent enough and then make pairs out of it. So your problem goes down. So this became, as I said, very, very you know, prominent because of Walmart. You know, the same person who did it in Walmart went to Amazon. So now you see, if you like this book, you may like that book. Okay? Uh, in data mining literature, there are thousands of papers on this. People have made career out of this problem. Okay? So Netflix yeah. does that also. I mean, Netflix does that also. That's, yeah. There is algorithm is different. Also. There is slightly different. So in recommendation, this is purely based on the items themselves. But you can also ask if these people are friend of each other. That's the new twist to this problem. So because of Facebook and so on, you can actually bring in the social context. If you didn't have that, then all you have to say is, is it purchased together? So, but it, it sort of is a related problem. Yeah. But the big question is, can we apply this technology to this problem? Because this problem was very similar. And the main thing to observe is the following, that we don't have transactions in this space because it's a continuous space. So that's the big challenge. So because of that, you need a new model. And that's all I would basically say here. So there were people you know, who tried to make transactions like this. So if you look at this is the, your basic data, some people will draw circles of this kind. And, um, but the problem there is you have a lot of double counting and under counting. Okay, so as against that, our group used something like MRF. These are called neighborhood graphs. We use a, a neighborhood graph model and define statistics on that, which has some nice properties and algorithms. And I think that's all I want to say here. So let me try to go to the last slide in interest of time and give you a feeling for what we talked about and where it may go next. So in terms of um, you know, what are the differences, you probably notice even at the data level, there are differences in spatial database or data the relationships are often implicit, whether it's distance or direction or topology, and you have to pre, you know, compute and provide it to your data mining models. If you look at statistical foundation, again, you saw a lot of differences like autocorrelation, heterogeneity, and so on. And because of that, as you go to these pattern families, your models start to change. So that's, that's the main thing we talked about. And as you add time, things get richer. And I will maybe you know, you get that and show you what the best. This is where a lot of work is now, with space and time, not in space. So just let me pause and see if there are any questions. Very nice. Okay. Uh, Thank you. <coughs> yes, okay. go ahead. Did you see something like a like counter map from pictures of terrain taken by satellites or something using these techniques? Okay, so. So can you repeat one question? Which kind of map you want to get? Contour. Contour map. Elevations. Elevations. So the techniques which start from satellite imagery or aerial imagery <coughs> and extract map features, uh, they come in two key flavors. I think the closest we came to that was the classification prediction that we were talking about by next problem. They may be closest to that. So right now the techniques that are used are the following. Uh, from satellite imagery, people make land cover maps. So they classify it into green area or, or water or urban area. And they are often very similar to what you know in machine learning. People use this in uh, And people sometimes do train that sensor and get signature of these models to use different techniques. And, but they would do smoothing. If you don't do smoothing, you get salt and pepper noise. So that's where you do MRF smoothing afterwards. Or you can use this spatial autocorrelation aware techniques which will do the smoothing in your process. So, so that's why it be done. When it comes to terrain map, you're thinking about elevation now, right? Elevation maps usually are made in a different way as far as I know. So the latest and greatest is LIDAR. Okay? So LIDAR will directly give you the reflectance and it's giving you all you need to do is the little smoothing. It's more expensive, but that is, I think, the, the, the more recent class thing to do that. Um, yeah, I will have to go back and see how they did the previous one. So, so EEM and EJ before LIDAR were done in a different way, but I have not seen these techniques at LIDAR. I was just wondering if there is a way to merge computer vision techniques with these techniques for that kind of problem. It was. So, uh, certainly in map creation, these two words come together. Right? And if you are doing object recognition, so the way I see it, you know, computer vision's main strength is if you know the type of dog. You know I'm looking for cars or houses. Then computer vision kind of goes much further, does much better. 
Whereas these techniques are you know, more amorphous, like general class and black color class and so on. But computer vision does use, it does get used a lot to produce the map. That, that does happen. For question? So the, so the LiDAR data is, um, uh, John, you, you guys use LiDAR data, right? Okay. So, so what, what do you, you want to say? Well, you I, I have a question about yeah. LiDAR related. It's kind of specific, but okay. uh, I'll give it to you. Okay. Uh, now, some of the LiDAR that I work with uh, is, is beyond just the, the last return. So we have okay. a point cloud. Okay. So we have this three-dimensional distribution of points in space. Now, one of my students in the past, he's used that to classify parts. But what he did was he binned it, uh, so he took vertical bins and looked at the relationships uh, among those vertical bins. But what he did incorporate, which I always thought he should have, would have been the relationship in space that one bin is above another. And so, I mean, is there some kind of technique that, that you could think of that would uh, take into consideration the, the three-dimensional patterns of the data, uh, not just strictly the fact that you have a lot of points in the low bin and fewer points in the high bin, but how those bins are related. Are related yeah. So I, I haven't worked a lot with LiDAR, so you know, maybe after the talk, you know, we can maybe look at and understand what those bins are. Yeah, see, okay. so when you showed the, uh, uh, the Ripley's K kinds of right. functions, you know, right. like three dimensions, I right. always think that well, that's a point cloud out there. Right. So right. you're trying to figure out the relationships in space and different critical, critical areas, area. different forest types. Right. So I think I said maybe after the talk we should sit down and discuss. But you probably know the remote sensing field, right? I mean, there are all these different philosophies. There is photogrammetry, there is remote sensing. And remote sensing, one thing they do very well, which I'm guessing people are doing with LiDAR, is that they actually create these signatures, right? So you can go and reflect radar out of trees of different kind and say what signature I get. Right? You can reflect it off the ground, you know, of the rocks. And then once you know the signature, then it probably allows you to separate those returns and say, is this return more typical of the canopy? Or is this return more typical of the ground underneath? Actually, I don't think they're there yet. I okay. think that's that's where they need to move. Mm -hmm. okay. I think that's that's one of the, the questions right. that comes out. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. right. So I think there are all kinds of techniques. On the other hand is this photogrammetry, which is very manual technique. Mm -hmm. But you basically create a, a stereoscopic kind of image. And there is a person sitting there and measuring, almost like hand surveying. <laughs> and they do that inch by inch for highway construction, right? Mm -hmm. So there is a whole variety of techniques. And the catch is, you know, as in computer science, we would like to automate more and more of that using vision techniques. Yeah. Yeah, so the LiDAR data, I think that one of the things they are trying to do is um, get these, you know, tree tops uh, and so on. So how many trees are there, and what kind of trees. And then they also do uh, some archaeological you know, means to get a data. Uh, our, our actually interim provost, you know, she's uh, very big in that. She's an anthropologist. Uh, and they get the data, data, data from Bayern, all the things in that. So it's a very interesting thing. Hey, go ahead. Um, uh, <coughs> you, uh, you looked at uh, so, again, in my case, when you're saying subspace learning and so on, are you relating back to association rules or your rule? So, the association rules are formalized as subspace learning in statistical literature. And the closest our group has worked on is the co-location problem. Right? So as I was telling you, the association rule machinery was built around a specific input format that you have feature types, but you also have transactions. But unfortunately, in spatial data, we don't have transactions. So the question is, you know, how can you still get those then subspaces? And the way our group approached it is to create a neighborhood graph. But spatial data, at least, you, know, you have a location for each instance of each feature. And once you have the location, you can define a neighborhood based on distance and some other problem. It's sort of like Marco random field defines a neighborhood based on distance. Right? The only difference here is that it's not a regular tree. MRF typically is a very regular structure. But if I have arbitrary points like road accidents or cancer deaths, then 
the points are a little bit more spread out, or non homogeneously spread out. But you can still define a neighborhood graph based on this. So if you create, if you say a pair of point is neighbor, if they are within, let's say, half mile or one mile, then you will get a graph. Once you get a graph, then you can define statistics, which I didn't really mention. So we have a statistic named participation index. And it has two nice properties. On one hand, it has a special statistical interpretation. So it's actually upper bound under the k function, cross k function. On the other hand, it also has this monotonicity property of support. So you have a very nice balance of computational properties and statistical properties. So, then, so this came out of our uh, group in our 2001 thesis was completed. And uh, there are several hundred citations. So many people have followed up on publication work. Some have tried to add statistical significance, many have tried to speed up the algorithm. It does tend to be more expensive than so. So that is the closest from our group. And then I think there were many follow-up grants as well. So people know are we wanted to do it with time. So the moving object trajectory I was showing you, that tried to look for these pairs with moving objects. So that was another thesis. And there's another one with spatiotemporal pattern or causation kind of pattern. So so that's closest what our group. So this moving object thing, I think we have done but so in one way is that you know you learn this um, kind of PDF, right? You have X and Y and two objects, you know, what's the probability that you know, these two will move together and use that to find these you know, uh, I mean you you have some training with that and then you what you have done is given Yes, that we can protect. Right. If somebody is moving here, then you can see that. Yes. Right. So these are a little simpler than the other. So the probability distribution function. Let me maybe show one slide yeah. to give a feeling for what these techniques look like. PDFs usually are more computationally expensive. Uh, let me see if I can. Okay, this must be the. Yeah. Let me just show one slide on this. Okay. These are kind of coarser than PDF. I'm just looking, let me see. Yeah, this slide might be the one. Just to give a flavor, uh, no, actually, no, not this. Okay, collocation, yeah. Yeah, maybe this. Just to give a flavor, you know, these are sort of, um, little coarser. So this is sort of giving you the statistics that we define on the graph. <coughs> so, so first we define this participation ratio in very simple. And all it is doing is to say that you know, if you look at a particular feature, f i, and let's say this has 10 instances, then I'm asking how what fraction of those have this co-location, they participate in that. Right? So if you look at Burger King and McDonald's, Let's say there is 1,000 of each. So I will first ask, out of the 1,000 McDonald's, what fractions have Burger King next to it? And let's suppose that's 60%. Six, right? So that's participation ratio of McDonald's in this pair. Then I will ask the same question on Burger King. Maybe there are 70% Burger King which have McDonald's close by. And then I take the minimum of the So it's a minimum of 60% and 70% is 60%. So this is sort of a lower bound on the probability that if I see a McDonald, what is the probability I see Burger King nearby? As well as if I see Burger King, what's the probability? So it's it's a very you can say you can say the poor man's probability yeah. distribution. Yeah, it's a very simple one. But the reason we do that is because it has this nice computational problem. Because once you do that, then computationally I can start throwing away combinations very fast. So it's a trade-off between computational scalability and your probabilistic statistical rate. That has to be the other in this case. Which is the same thing that happened in association rule. If you look at support measure, the support measure, the way it ranks pattern is very different than how you will rank it using correlation coefficients. In fact, in late 90s, there used to be bitter arguments between statisticians and data miners. Because some cases, the rankings are completely different. So there are examples where support and confidence measure ranks it very high but the correlation is negative. Right? 
So this used to be, uh, you know, statisticians will call data mining black magic. <laughs> this happened. Uh, but then a couple of people came around. David Hand was the first statistician in Britain who came and he explained and he created that you know, the terminology of subspace. Right. He basically said what these people are looking for is different. Here is how you can interpret it. And then sort of the communities came together. So a lot more statisticians started coming to data mining. The big data debate, fortunately, they, instead of fighting, they have joined forces in the data together. But late 90s, it was a very bitter time. They got all kinds of things. So that's basically the trick here. It's a trade off. It's a trade off. We are the data mining. Another route of data mining is the following, which may be good to also understand. So if you go to mid 90s, you had all these nice statistical software like SAS, right, with every Fortune 500 users. How many of us know SAS here? But those, in order to run that, your data had to fit in main memory. Right? Whereas relational databases had been around for two decades now, and many people had data sets which could not fit in main memory. So what do we do that there? So data mining did two kinds of things. First, it will take the old techniques like KB and try to make it IO aware so that you can go and fetch things on disk and work with it. But then it got creative and it said, well, maybe you should take a trade-off and say, what can you really do? And that's where association would be. So, so, so the mindset of scalability was paramount. So that was their niche. Their niche was this scalability. So first they said, well, you know, there's some statistical technique we can scale up easily. Others, we cannot. So maybe we need to just water down the statistics. Right. Okay, very good. Okay, well, thanks again.